very happy to be here. Um, Eric and I will be sharing this presentation, but I'm going to get us started. Um, and what we'll be talking about, as was already introduced, is our work as part of a more social science-driven user experience group at the Renault, Nissan, Mitsubishi Alliance Innovation Lab of Silicon Valley. And we should give a prize for whoever can repeat that at the end, um, but you see it here. Um, we are a mixture of Nissan, Renault, and um, potentially in the future Mitsubishi, the latest partner to our alliance, working on many different things, um, but including autonomous vehicles. So uh, the work that we'll be discussing tonight comes from the work that we've been doing there. So um, you might know that we make cars, and uh, the cars that we make include for example, the best-selling, people don't know this, best-selling electric car vehicle in the world, the Nissan LEAF. Uh, so your standard automotive companies, right? Renault in Europe, Nissan, multinational, global, but Japanese, United States, many other places, and Mitsubishi as well. But we also work on autonomous vehicles, and we've had a lab here in Silicon Valley since 2014 which has been one of the centers of excellence for the development of the autonomous vehicle software, the intelligence in the system for, uh, for building autonomous vehicles. And so we were brought in as a social science, a more user-centered sort of group, to really think deeply and to develop solutions or ways forward in how autonomous vehicles will interact with people in the world, how they will operate, how they should behave, perhaps how they should provide service to people, how they would communicate, and all these kinds of issues. So let me uh, take you into some of the work about why this is interesting for us. So we look at interactional spaces with autonomous vehicles. We think a lot about what's happening in the vehicle. Now most people, when they think about what's going to change with the interactions of autonomous vehicles, they tend to think about the change to the driver experience, especially, right? Drivers have to be willing to um, give up some sort of control, and they're going to rely on, there's a lot of interesting HCI kinds of questions in the driver, um, shifting driver experience, in terms of what kind of information will people use and not be able to use, when is their cognitive overload, how should that information be delivered, and then what are the actual control systems that should or shouldn't be touched as these transitions happen. But what we're also interested in is what will happen with everybody else on the road. So the interaction of a vehicle on the road with other re road users, and as we think this is where the part of our social science dedication comes from, is recognizing that these other people on the road didn't invite themselves to be there. They're not w users who can opt in or opt out of the system. If you happen to be driving next to a car that's an automated vehicle, you didn't ask to be there. So our responsibility to these other users, we believe, is especially deep and especially profound, and what should we do with that? So we've been looking at these questions of what are the interactions on the road, and how can we drive this towards more social acceptability? So I'm going to walk you through a couple of the different kinds of studies and questions that we've been doing before we turn to the main body of today's talk, which will be on carefully designing autonomous vehicle systems in a larger sense. So as we think about what happens on the road, let's just take a look. We do a lot of ethnographic, video-based interaction kinds of analysis, real-world observations. Um, so I'm going to play a video here. And we're just going to see a very normal sort of circumstance with people traveling through an intersection. You see a pedestrian and a vehicle over there who have a little conflict over whose turn it is and who's going to go first. You have two cars who arrive at this four-way stop at roughly the same time. So they have to figure out not just whose turn it is, but do they agree and have a shared understanding about whose turn it is and who will go first. Here we have another pedestrian interaction with the vehicle and this one with a very explicit and direct kinds of communication where you have not just a gaze, but you have a waving and eye contact and the very direct kind of uh, communication. So we ask, you know, what would happen if you remove drivers from that view? What happens to all these interactional kinds of moments on the road? 
this may seem sort of, you know, manageable in a setting like this. There's nothing remarkable about that. I can assure you that not a single person in this video thought twice about, you know, five minutes later, they have no recollection of the interaction they just had, unless there was somebody cute in the setting and something else went on there. But, you know, their, their life is just going on. Um, and as I think we know, autonomous vehicles are being developed and tested in places that are kind of, you know, familiar, places that might look like this. But what happens in a very different kind of place? So here is a setting. Um, let me see if I can get this to play, hopefully. Oh, dear. Okay. So this is in Iran. This is a roundabout in the city of Mashhad, which is in northeast Iran. Just take a, keep your eyes on the guy running down the center of the road here. Um, this is a fairly typical kind of traffic arrangement. Actually, this wasn't a particularly busy time of day or busy encounter. It's a major intersection there, a roundabout. But you, of course, will notice there's people walking through the center of the roundabout. The cars are going in every which direction. People weave in and out of the traffic. And we have video that will suggest that this goes on all over the place. And so the principle, we're not trying to say that the logic doesn't exist, but the logic, of course, is quite different about how you use space and what would happen. So we're, we're using this kind of thinking to defamiliarize ourselves, and ideally to defamiliarize the developers of the software system to remember that things are not always going to look like it looks when we walk outside our door and how to design and develop for places like that. But in fact, we think that the responsibility goes a lot further. It's not just about the people on the traffic, in the traffic on the road, who are having to navigate and negotiate what happens on the road, but it's people in what we would think of as adjacent spaces or um, street side kinds of activities who are also affected. For example, we see here a picture of a valet parker in a hotel who, as you see, is kind of ushering and protecting a father and his child as a new customer who's arrived for parking services is just pulling in, in into this pedestrian marked zone. So what about the people who work on the road, like valet parkers, like sanitation workers, like people, garbage truck collectors, school crosswalk, crossing guard, um, people who help people cross the street? I, don't have the name right. What about people who are on the streets for other reasons entirely? Like if any of you live in the area and you encounter the bike party. You're there, people are bicyclists or they're en masse just to party and have a good time. What about um, uh, flea markets or farmers markets where the streets are suddenly changed and the kind of activity around there changes too? So we believe strongly that the stakeholders for what happens in the very mundane behavioral aspects of having autonomous vehicles on the road, we need to extend it all the way out. Now, this is not work that we tend to ourselves do. As you see here, we've partnered with anthropology programs um, at San Jose State University and the University of North Texas to begin to look more deeply at these other kinds of stakeholders and understand their concerns, their interests, their expectations for what this future holds. So, we have a lot of um, other p talks that we could give that would tell you something about the kinds of results and uh, directions that we drive this work. We work with the system developers on the core models that underlie the intelligent systems, on the perception systems, on the algorithms that are figuring out everything from what happens when you translate from a perception system forward into the location element of a of a system architecture and especially the decision making of an autonomous vehicle. So we work at the heart of the, the system development. And then one of the things that our group in particular has been very focused on is the question of whether autonomous vehicles um, would benefit from being able to communicate in new ways with people on the exterior. So we work on exterior lighting signals or communication signals to indicate something about what the vehicle is doing. So if we had other talks, we would take that path. But today, we want to take yet a different direction and focus on another element of our work. So in this element, um, we are looking at the, um, the, the, the question of how whole systems or fleets of autonomous vehicles would operate. I don't know what just happened there. Um, uh-oh. Uh -oh. 
what happens. It's not on our side because this is. No. Yeah, she's awake. Searching. Searching, searching. So while we're trying to get resolve this, I see Ted's gone to get somebody to help us here. And you notice I didn't even have autonomous systems. Don't we love them? They're very helpful. Uh, <laughs> these are the kinds of things we care about, right? right? What is the interaction? And our concern, just to, to kind of reiterate, is not just on the individual user interactions, but at the societal dimensions or the larger scale cumulative effect of having these systems out in the world. So I increasingly started to think not so much of human-centered design, which is, of course, a worthy and lovely goal, but really humanity-centered design, where we have to confront what might be conflicting interests or conflicting expectations and concerns about what these systems become. Um, I already mentioned that we would look at like school cross guards or with, um, uh, with sanitation workers on the road. You can imagine that their interest is in having very conservative, very safe, very uh, uh, well-behaved uh, vehicle systems on the road. But if you're in a car and you're trying to get somewhere, you want to get there. And so if we build towards the dominance of the automotive user, right, the car user, we have to think about that. Like how will people be patient enough to accept and use these kinds of systems as they, as they hit the road? So while we're figuring this out, let me introduce you to what we're doing with, um, with this dimension of managing fleets of autonomous vehicles. And hopefully we'll get something up um, soon. Um, what our scientists in our lab realize is that by having autonomous systems, you still have to account for where there are humans in the loop somewhere in that system. So I like to think of the problem not as complete autonomy, but really the question of where you're putting the human actions and human behavior in controls vis-a-vis -vis the system. Today's world, it's a driver in a car, and that's where the core systems are. But in the future, we could have humans somewhere, but where are they going to be? And in particular, what uh, the scientists in our lab realize is that, like any other system of autonomous um, uh, machines or, or systems, that they will at times need help. They will at times reach the extent of what they're capable of and be able to have to be able to extend beyond until they learn how to go to the next level. And that what we'll really need is a human in the loop support for autonomous systems. So we've developed a technology out of our lab, um, the Renault, Nissan, Mitsubishi Alliance Innovation Lab. I try to say that as often as possible just because I get the rhythm down. Uh, a capability that's called seamless autonomous mobility that allows us to access the vehicle systems to gain situational awareness through the cameras, the LIDAR, the radar, all the information that the vehicle has, and use it to help a vehicle in the event that it's in a situation that it can't handle, or again, that it's extended the bounds of its capability. If you know anything about autonomous vehicles, you know there's a heavy reliance on high definition maps that have been especially de de designed for the system to drive in those areas. What if you arrive at a place that hasn't been mapped, like a private parking lot, and you now want to get a, a, a passenger of a robo-taxi not just to the beginning of that parking lot, but all the way to the front door? That might be a situation in which having some extra capability to be able to zoom in, access where the vehicle is and the situation it's in, and be able to support it uh, to go on. So we, as social scientists, of course, are asking, and I guess we'll see what happens here if we can get um, <laughs> Dina back in. Any, any luck in having? No luck. We're still not detecting anything on the other side. Very interesting. Okay. okay. Is it working for me to keep talking? All right, okay, I'm gonna keep talking, act like it's behind me, and we'll, no, we'll catch up when we can. Yeah? So, So we will remotely help the autonomous vehicle, but we will not, the, our system as it is today is not designed for remote driving. 
So what it is is we access the vehicle and the situation that it's in. We have a human in the loop, somebody sitting in the control center who can um, understand the situation it's in. And then, um, so that, such as this gentleman. So, and what the system does is they, these are, now they've accessed the cameras to understand what the car, where the car is and um, how it's situated, see all the way around the car to understand the situation. We access the LIDAR and we get the information about the system. And then let's say that it's behind an obstruction, that it can't, it can't get around. And that sounds like kind of, you know, you would think cars have to be able to get around obstructions, right? But I didn't include the picture. Imagine that you are a car behind, you've arrived at a construction zone, there's cones out. To get around, you have to go across a double yellow line, which you're not supposed to do. And the light is red, but there's a construction worker doing this, telling you to go around. That's a really complex situation. We used human judgment to decide which of those signals we're supposed to obey. So in that kind of situation, we have all this information to help us identify what could be done. And then what the, um, the, the remote supervisor in that case would do is they could create a new lane by drawing a new path for the vehicle. They send that to the vehicle so that the vehicle can still navigate everything autonomously and remains in control of its own safety at all times. But they now have a new um, goal and a new destination in the system to tell them how to get around. So as it is now, it's not a, it's not a joystick remote driving kind of um, scenario. So that's it, yeah. And seeing, monitoring all of their situations, and some of them signal that they're they need help, and so others. So the vision is that we will get to where we will, you know, um, we nor nobody else are driving thousands of cars at the moment. So, uh, but we will get to the situation where that would be the the kind of scenario that they would be monitoring, that the cars would be able to send up signals, but also that the system itself, with the cloud support, would be able to learn things about the environment and what's happening there. So we could maybe, um, if one vehicle has gone through a situation, another vehicle is coming behind, we've now already learned something about that environment. Now, in each case, you need to be specific to that local situated um, instance. So it might not be the exact same thing, but you're already primed as to what kinds of things you could do. So yeah, this is envisioned as a, as a fleet solution. How is your, your solution is slightly different. I mean, they, they actually drive There's the car. There's a Zerg joystick, yeah. Yeah. So in your case, you actually provide additional solution for the car's control system to do the same. So the two are slightly different. That's Can you correct. speak to yeah. the differences in the pros and cons of each approach? Yeah, I mean, I, so um, I, I, I don't want to go too far down that path. We are not the technologists who developed the system. We're here to talk about what happens to the people in that context. Um, but there's, I think you, you know, one could argue about the pros and cons in each case. Um, we do feel that the, the basis and the core of having the autonomy system remain in control of its own, you know, a, an autonomous vehicle system is making decisions every tenth of a second, right? Ten times per second. So um, it, it knows a lot and is constantly sensing and updating what it could be doing and should be doing. And so we don't want to interfere with the capabilities that it has to only override with at a distance. But in how it will play out at the end, as you know, this is a very rich space. There's actually a lot of companies who are getting into this. And I'm sure you know what the future holds will continue to, uh, to evolve. So let me explain a little bit more. I, I am going to just show you a brief video that explains some more of how this was developed and the goals behind it. We have worked in partnership with NASA on this. It's the same technology that is used um, in the interplanetary rovers in terms of um, that, that system that can access the onboard sensors and, and provide information. And then to carry on with the story about what about the people in this picture? Well, how do we have to think about what's going on for them? So now, if this actually works. Oh, we don't have sound. Oh dear.
we've been asking is what happens behind the scenes? In that video, you were in introduced to this role of a mobility manager. This is the person who would be sitting there and would be trying to um, supervise and understand, monitor what's happening in the system, and then offer that human in the loop support for a, a vehicle that is trying to do something that it, it's, is beyond its capability or, or, or take it in a new direction. So what kind of work is that? What kind of role is that? And what else happens to other people who are now using these technologies as a driver, as another person on the road, who have to realize that we now have a Wizard of Oz in the sky somewhere that is a real person who maybe is gonna play a role in this environment? What kind of communication interaction might be expected? How will people make sense of and learn to understand what those different roles are? And what are the, it, explicitly the technical challenge are what kinds of information needs to be exchanged and how, what are the kinds of problems that come up. So for that, we went and visited a um, bus system. We went to a small town in, or relatively small town in Colorado, Fort Collins, Colorado, a population of about 220,000 um, 220, people. Uh, it swells by about 50,000 additional people when students there, it's a college town, so when college is in session. Um, and why did we go to a bus system? As somebody said to us in our research, Nissan doesn't make buses, so what the heck are we doing there? We're there because we knew that a bus system already operates with a dispatch or remote supervision capability. So these transit systems already have people who are looking out for them and looking over them. So we wanted to learn more about what happens, what kind of work it is to interact between a dispatch and the buses, and how does that whole system operate. So um, we already knew going there, we anticipated that these um, dispatch people would spend a lot of time in front of the screens. They would be doing a lot to assess the information about what's going on. And we wanted to know more about how they use that, those resources what the whole setup for them, what the rhythm and tempo, you know, what was too much information, what wasn't enough, who initiated the interactions back and forth, what were the kinds of problems that emerged, how were they resolved, what happens in the aftermath, how was information recorded, and all that. Um, so we wanted to understand how this information system worked, but we also wanted to get a more sort of visceral feel of what it meant to sort of exist and survive and make your way in a system that has all these parts and pieces together in it. So to do that, we um, spent, we did a one week intensive study of this bus system. Um, I, just to say a little bit more about it, there's about 100 bus operators who work in this system. Um, there's up to 50 buses on the road at any given time. Um, in that area, there is no other mass transit system. There's no light rail or subway or anything like that. So it is um, a dedicated uh, public service system. They do have some ancillary additional services like paratransit that they operate. For the university, they might do you know middle of the night runs, those sorts of things. And there, in the last picture, you saw a max bus. There is one uh, bus rapid transit um, route that goes up and down the, the center of the city. Um, so how did all that work? And again, what was it like for people to understand who the different participants and players in that environment were? So um, we spent time trying to understand what that did by doing a lot of observation. We rode with bus drivers on different routes. We spent a lot of time in the dispatch center itself at all different times of day and night. Um, and we went to some of the management meetings, staff meetings to understand the different roles and the parts and players to learn again what it meant to operate a system uh, and, and to, to have it functional, always asking the question for ourselves, what would it mean if you begin to remove the driver from any one of these um, scenes? So in this case, if we remove drivers from buses, how would this whole system operate? What happens then? to information requirements, to communications, and to the experience of people in the system. So I'm actually gonna hand over at this point to Eric, who is going to take us now deeply into what we learned about careful design for social acceptability with our bus system. Hopefully it'll, it'll all work for you. <laughs> I hope so, thank you. Um, so 
what we saw in the field um, was that it took an interlocking set of roles, um, different people doing different things to make mobility possible inside of this inside of this bus system. And the three roles that we're going to focus most on, they were the ones that took up most of our research time and where a lot of our findings are, are focused about, are the um, bus operators themselves, the dispatchers um, in the dispatch center that we just saw, and then road supervisors. Um, so the, the you know, bus operators are out there in the world driving along their routes. Road supervisors um, are also out in the field, usually based at a transit center, and they handle sort of problems in the local area. And then dispatchers are sort of watching all of this happen. They're organizing and managing these employees from this transit center, a center of coordination. Um, and so in the system that we were, we were looking at, it's fairly small. Um, at peak, there were four dispatchers managing, you know, as Melissa said, up to about 50 bus operators with maybe one to three road supervisors in the field, just to give you a sense of the kind of scale um, of personnel that we were looking at. And each of these sort of individual groups had particular tasks that they were doing. We saw one of the dispatchers before in that image on the right-hand side, you know, looking at a variety of screens, in front of a telephone, in front of a radio. Um, they're generally divided in the system between a pair on the left-hand side of, of, they're in one room, and the pair on the left-hand side is handling sort of active issues. Um, a bus is in the field and breaks down somewhere. Those are the people who jump in to assist. Um, and then the other side of the room, you have you know, one to two dispatchers who are handling managerial um, tasks. They're planning the next day or the next week's operations. And they'll jump in if there's a sort of high demand period where there are lots of issues. Um, and if it's a sort of low demand period, then even some of the people who are on call will sort of fall back to doing managerial work. So they're sort of managing routing um, sort of ahead of time and then rerouting if there are issues in the field. They're handling sort of schedules for other personnel, the bus operators in particular. And they're the people who are interfacing with other sort of city or regional offices. Um, so if a bus has an emergency, the operator calls into dispatch, dispatch calls emergency services. Or if somebody reports that there's a traffic light out, dispatch are the people who actually you know, call the, the city office to you know, go get someone on site. So that's kind of what dispatch is doing at a high level. The operators, we've also seen one of those on the left-hand side of that image driving the bus. Um, driving the buses is their sort of primary goal. Um, and especially safely driving the buses. One of the key values that this organization stressed over and over again, of course, is safety. That's something that's very important to them. Um, but bus operators are more than just drivers, as we discovered and as you know, some people could anticipate. Um, they are the interface between sort of passengers and the public and the transit organization as a whole. Um, they're the first line of contact you know, to the outside world. They handle accessibility issues, helping people with mobility problems get onto the bus, get buckled safely into their seats. Um, they also handle service questions, not only about their bus, but often about routes on the other side of, other side of the city. So a lot of the operators we spoke to carried around you know, little cue card things on their badges that had information about all of the different routes um, that the service offered so they could help you know, a passenger make a connection somewhere. Um, and they also are responsible for identifying an emergency situation and then calling for help. And then there's this sort of third, you know, cog in the machine here, the road supervisors. They were a very unexpected role um, for us. They have the most ad hoc responsibilities. Um, at one moment, they may be out in the field, um, you know, meeting up with a bus to make some sort of repair. They may be at a transit center dealing with some infrastructure that's failed. Um, they also drive around the bus routes all the time, looking for and preempting problems that might occur later in the day. And they're also there to provide a higher level of authority um, in the case that, again, somebody needs to interface with um, emergency services at the site of you know, an accident or a medical emergency, a road supervisor will go there to be the face of the organization. Um, they also drive around, as we'll see, in these white vans full of tools to sort of assist in this repair work that they do in the field on a day-to-day -day basis. So they're out there fixing things, reporting problems, and then acting as figures of authority. And so this was a sort of operational 
picture of the organization. This is some of the work that these people are doing just to keep things moving day to day. Um, to meet direct service objectives, to sort of fix a problem with a bus, to reroute somebody around an accident, etc. But one of the things that we came to when we looked at the system was that there was a lot more work going on than just this operational work. We observed systematic attention by all the parties to features and qualities of the service that went beyond ensuring efficient operations of the system. Um, and this was work that was about maintaining the integrity of infrastructures, not just the bus infrastructure, but other sort of city infrastructures in the environment, maintaining the safety, security, and comfort of passengers and employees, and you know, to some extent of vehicles and the public in general. Um, and in brief, I guess I would say it's maintaining the overall responsibility of this system to you know, others in the environment. And we call this a system of care. So we have a system of operations and a system of care. And these are two parallel intertwined you know, systems that are results of the, the labor of these same you know, three roles you know, that we looked at before. So we talk about this as a system of care, and this needs a little bit of introduction, I think. Um, drawing from Anne-Marie Moll, um, her work on the logic of care and healthcare. Um, and so she, for those of you who, who aren't familiar with her work, she's an anthropologist, works in, primarily in the European context. Um, and her subject matter is healthcare and particularly uh, diabetes related care. Uh, at least she has a whole book on that. And in, in her subject matter, um, there's these two values that are being pitted against each other. One of them is patient choice and one of them is pa patient care. And choice, you know, appears under the guise of presenting individuals with information and then with decisions, choices that they need to make based on that information. So an example would be, you know, you need a blood sugar monitor. Here are five blood sugar monitors. I can give you all of the technical details about them. You can read comparisons, you know, go off, process this information. You make a choice as to which one is right for you. By contrast, care you know, the way that she talks about it, care is achieved over time by informing people and providing support, cajoling, even sometimes forcing them to get out of bed or do things that they don't want to do but need to do for their own health, um, working with and otherwise providing assistance to patients. So the care version of this blood sugar monitor, you know, is, for instance, a nurse who has deep experience working with patients and can tell you, based on your lifestyle, you know, based on your, you know, current health, I think this product is really going to be the best one for you, and I'm going to highly recommend that you, you know, choose that one. Um, so <clears throat> she is sort of setting up this dichotomy between care and choice and saying that the healthcare model is moving more and more towards this choice-based, you need to make the choice, we're going to give you the information and put all the responsibility on you as a patient, um, but that really there's a lot to be sort of valued in that in that care aspect that sort of works with people over time and helps them, um, even if they sometimes don't have as much choice as they would in the other model. Uh, Anne-Marie Moll and others who've worked on care work um, have found that this is you know, often labor that's not acknowledged by professional standards and measurement systems, and that's true in healthcare and, and nursing as well, even though that work is critical to the functioning of the organizations that depend on it. Um, care labor, you know, often happens outside of the market frame. It's uncompensated. It's situated in the home. It's provided for primarily by women, though not exclusively. Um, and some of this typically household labor is increasingly being like brought back into business organizations, seeking to provide for ever increasing amounts of their employees' needs. So that's a, another trend that's happening here. But a lot of this work is sort of written out of of discussions of organizational work. So we're looking to expand how care work is thought about in distributed organizations like this transport system with different roles playing you know, different pieces. We also see the system of care as something that operates at multiple scales for people and objects alike. So we're trying to bring the care of humans closer together with the repair of machines and the maintenance of infrastructures. Um, so we would say that relational care work is tied to customization, to maintenance, and to repair. And all of these things may be oriented towards larger groups of people and things alike, talking about caring for you know, an infrastructure or a public. So we see an opportunity here, or we saw an opportunity in this work to unify 
care and repair, and to bring together caring relations of humans and non-humans into larger systems of the two, to think about you know, what happens to this kind of work as individual roles and you know, skills within a system are automated away. In the system we studied, we saw care and efficiency being two key values that were being balanced, uh, with care often predominating in practice. Um, so to sum up, care, care work as we identified it in this, in this organization is happening over time. It's oriented directly towards relationships to others. It occurred in everything from the smallest of daily tasks to multi-year projections and plans, and we'll see some examples of this in a moment. It involved the buses and physical infrastructure as well as employees and customers. So all of these were cared for. And we wanted to ask, you know, what happens to this work as roles get automated? And we wanted to argue for make, making sure that we retain an attention to care in increasingly automated vehicle or service systems that we develop. So we wrote a paper about this um, in, I guess it was in October. Um, and our conclusion was with sort of five key questions to think about while doing system design as part of a, this sort of careful process. So first, we want to ask, is a service system design, you know, or an autonomous system design, investing in the skill and autonomy of people within that system? Or is it trying to eliminate that skill and autonomy? And we would argue that care requires appropriate modulation of human autonomy within a system. And this connects to old themes of artificial intelligence versus intelligence augmentation and long-standing arguments over the dangers of de-skilling. Second, um, is the design attending to where work will shift or is it sort of vainly hoping that that work will just go away? Um, and when automation systems are introduced to do a certain part of a task, we see historically again and again that some work is always transferred somewhere. It doesn't just go away. It's shifted in time or in space. Um, in role shifted maybe from people on the factory floor towards you know, engineers working behind the scenes, but that work remains. And being careful here requires not overloading any one part of the system by failing to attend for the way that work is going to reshape you know, around the introduction of an automated system. And this point sort of responds to the myths of autonomy and aligns with these sort of holistic perspectives on system design that you know, we try to take in our work. Third, and connected to this question of skill and autonomy, um, is the design creating a structure that will do the extra little bit to serve people well? Um, a service will need to behave appropriately on the margins, even in situations that are ambiguous, and somebody's judgment's gonna be required to sort of make those situations go smoothly. And today, humans are usually called upon to make those judgments and go beyond the sort of road application of procedure. <coughs> and so we think about this as not just investing in skill, as in the first point, but also having norms and values within the system that are conducive to people making those calls in situations where it's really important. Fourth, is a design trying to measure the right things, and is it leaving room for the uncertainties that will inevitably you know, happen and cause the third point here? Um, so surely we don't want to you know, entirely remove ourselves from numerical metrics. They're good for measuring lots of things. But we also have to remember we can't count on them to be neutral, objective, or complete. Um, numerical metrics are always open to being gamed. They're always showing one part of a situation and not another. And so we need to support those with a, a sort of robust um, set of different kinds of measures. And finally, on that point, you know, we need to ask if the success of a design is accountable to the things about it that, are, that we want to come out that are unmeasured or perhaps even unmeasurable. You know, this is something about, does it do the right thing in the end? Um, and we would argue that caring means reserving a space um, for things that are qualitatively right, even when you can't necessarily measure how close you are you know, to getting to them. And we suggest in the paper that organizations could use something like reflective tools to keep tabs on those processes in a participatory way. I think this is also what various kinds of experts do you know, in, in systems is be that you know, voice of a different register of knowledge than just metrics. So to explore these more deeply today, we're just gonna look at sort of the first two, um, thinking about with some examples that we saw in the field and one particular story. Um, where do we see situated judgment calls in the use of autonomy? And where do we see shifts in work um, that need to be thought about while designing automated portions of this system? 
Now, this is a bus. It looks like a fairly unremarkable situation, except that it's a little bit rainy. And this is something that we, you know, we saw while we were out in the field. And you know, one might be predisposed to think that, that bus travel is relatively simple. The bus stops, the door opens, you get on, you pay. Then the bus driver pulls away again and takes you to your destination. But sometimes things that are unexpected and untoward happen, like in this case, where this bus actually slid and is stuck against the median. I'm not sure how easy it is to see here, but there's actually like a median with a curb right there. So it was trying to make a right turn, and it slid and got stuck after a rainstorm when the road was really slippery. The bus shown here from behind is blocking part of a lane of travel in this direction and has actually completely blocked the, the, the two lanes going in that other direction off to the right. But it also can't back up on its own because policy um, in this organization requires that there's a spotter who can stand behind the bus, keep other people clear, and help the bus back up. And this is for the safety of others because visibility behind these buses is limited. So when out of the ordinary events like this occur, operators in the bus are the first line of response. But keeping passengers in the public safe requires lots of different kinds of work from these three roles that we saw before. So the first thing that the bus operator did over the radio was call into dispatch to let them know of the issue. And so immediately, the two dispatchers who are on the left-hand side of the room get involved. The one on the right um, is on the radio talking to the bus operator, trying to identify exactly where you know, this, this situation happened, exactly what is the situation on the ground. And it took you know, a significant amount of time and energy and conversation between these two people to figure out what the bus operator was even describing, you know, what had happened in this, in this case. The one on the left, even though they don't have all of the information, the one on the left is already calling a road supervisor to the same radio channel to assist. So when problems you know, like this are identified in the field, somebody needs to get out there and be the spotter to deal, with, to deal with the problem. And that's where road supervisors and other sorts of field support personnel come in. Um, they're already in the field in vans like the white vans here. It's a field support filled with tools and supplies. Um, so sometimes they assist with stuck bus situations like this. As I said before, other times they'll be doing things like fixing down signage or opening and closing a bus stop you know, that has had to change because there was construction on a road. But sometimes, such as in the case that we observed here, road supervisors aren't actually in a position to assist at the right time. The only road supervisor on duty was on the other side of town, stuck in traffic, and might take 20 minutes to arrive at the scene. So the dispatchers told the road supervisor to go that way anyway, just in case, but that would be a long time for a bus to be stuck blocking traffic on this road. So they needed to come up with another solution. So next, the dispatchers asked another operator, who's actually on the other side of this window here, um, to go to the scene in a loaned vehicle to help be the spotter and help the bus back up, thinking that they might arrive sooner than the road supervisor. This operator was signing off at the end of his day's shift. He was going home. Um, but he said, yes, you know, he would do this. He would go behind his, beyond his usual role and responsibility to assist in a crisis. So while the dispatchers were doing all of this to sort of get people to the scene, they were also handling different tasks in the background. Um, the dispatchers called the police to let them know that a bus was at this location blocking traffic just in case anybody else called. So the police had been forewarned. Um, a dispatcher and the operator also deliberated about whether it was safe to put out cones behind the bus as per policy. You know, whenever a bus is stopped blocking a lane, you should go put out cones behind it so that people have forewarning and can move over. Um, and they also talked about whether it would be safe to allow a passenger who wanted to get off, because they were tired of being stuck on this bus, to get off at that location. Um, and this was a case where the you know, operator in the bus and the dispatcher deliberated about, you know, what was the right thing to do, and the call eventually went, you know, to the to the operator themselves. Um, and it was this situated judgment call about risk, based on the person being there and saying, you know, I think this would be safe to do, or I think this would not be safe to do, even though it's procedure. That was the deciding factor in both of these cases. 
And so this makes a bigger point in sort of in general that the operators are responsible for keeping order on and around the bus and for making these kinds of decisions that require an intimate knowledge of what the scene looks like. And they're stewards of their domain even when they're just putting down the ramp for an ordinary pickup. They're sort of managing these situational factors around the bus. And informal connections, the story makes another point actually, informal connections and informal labor matter a lot in this organization. In the case of the stuck bus, the decisive help was finally provided not by the road supervisor or the operator they sent out from this transit center, but yet another party, a different operator who was returning home at the end of his day. And the dispatcher here on the left is on her cell phone with this operator. She knew the operator, knew the route by which he would be traveling home, and called to ask for his assistance, figuring he might just be in the right place at the right time. And so this kind of flexibility and knowledge, actually, when we you know, were in this system observing for a week, it came into play in all kinds of different crisis situations. So when it was discovered that important route changes hadn't been made on time, one of the dispatchers who would usually be you know, sitting or standing at his desk got down on the floor with printouts and driver's information folders called paddles, which are the blue folders there that they take onto the bus that have all of the route and stop information. He got down on the floor to sort of bring these things up to date. And this human autonomy, responsibility, and flexibility, doing what's necessary in the moment, whether or not it's you know, in your job description directly, whether or not it's procedure, is key to responding to uncertain events in the world. And the dispatchers consistently made calls to prioritize public safety and to ensure a good transit experience. And they went beyond the procedural, using their tools in non-standard ways and doing the best they could with what they had. And it was through this sort of informal caring labor that the stuck bus situation was finally resolved. It took just a few seconds of the volunteer spotter who stopped on his way home to direct the bus backwards and then it was able to continue on its normal route. The dispatchers could then inform the other parties that their help was no longer required and they could return to the things that they were doing before. So now that we've sort of seen this story, I wanna return to this overview of the roles and think about the way in which these are a system and form a system of care. So what are each of these roles doing you know, that make them a system? We have the operators here who are in orange. And as I said before, they sort of live and work along these routes. They're moving linearly through the world. They have a very high definition picture of what's going on at like one particular point in space at one particular time. They're reporting problems. They're engaging with passengers. They're doing this kind of work. Road supervisors who are in pink here are moving between transit centers where they're based and surrounding areas as needed and they provide the sort of regional point of view of what's going on in the general area. Meanwhile, dispatch is in the, in the dispatch center. They're watching the map. They're integrating the information from all these different sources into a strategic picture. So these are spatially distinct roles that work together. And they're not even all of the roles that we could have talked about and all the roles that we saw and interacted with when we were at Transport. So there's other groups we've left out of the picture. There's the operations folks who you know, supervise dispatch itself. Um, there's the maintenance crews working behind the scenes to keep the buses running. And each of these groups has different roles as the system evolves in time at different points in the day, each quarter and each year, which adds like a third dimension to our diagram thinking about how these things evolve in time. Now the idea that systems require a delicate balance of labor to maintain them is nothing new. Um, but what we show is that a lot of this work, whatever else it may be, is also care work and caring work. It involves taking care of people and things and it's performed with a sense of meaning and responsibility rather than just through duty or procedure. Um, we've talked about the system of care already in terms of the roles of its constituent people. What is each of these you know, actors doing at a given time? But it's also possible to turn this around and look in the other direction at what properties and what things are being cared for. And I think this helps make clear the systemic and mutually reinforcing nature of the care practices involved. So you have, you know, a bus system depends on vehicles. Vehicles are cared for through, you know, fueling, through daily pre-checks which you know, are required by law, but it's also something that people take you know, very seriously and, and do a serious job with. They're cared for through preventative maintenance and repair. 
Um, employees are cared with, for in this system through training, through ensuring safe working conditions, through responsible scheduling, through information sharing from management about things that they need to be aware of. Customers are cared for via accurate transit information, through the provision of safe and clean vehicles through on-time service and welfare checks, which is another one of these things that didn't make it into our story, but is actually worth pausing for a moment on. Um, so bus operators, you know, somewhat routinely, uh, will see people by the side of the road who may be having some sort of a medical issue. Somebody is lying down on the grass, you know, are they just taking a nap or are they passed out? Do they need medical attention? And so this is a situation, they, they have a name for it as a welfare check. Um, where they will either send a road supervisor or actually call emergency services to go check up on this person who's on the side of the road and find out, you know, are they okay? Do they need help? Um, and it's one way that we saw these buses being used as a sort of roving information platform to sort of, you know, better the city and the surrounding community in a way that was, I think, somewhat unexpected for us as researchers. Um, Above all, these separate subsystems of care work put together maintain and allow for the movement of people and vehicles. So movement through this system is maintained by coordination and timely communication between these different roles that we see here and between the vehicle system and the other municipal services that share the same streets you know, and need to be sort of cooperated with to make everything function. And sort of jumping up a level even further, there's of course management roles that we spent some time with who are making long-term decisions about how all these other pieces fit together and will fit together through time that turn this into a sort of messy four-dimensional hypercube of a diagram. Um, and they also express care work in their own ways, um, working on the culture of this organization, working on things like timing the acquisition of buses so that you don't have 20 buses that were all purchased at the same time that all start to have the same problems at the same moment and now you have a big sort of monetary and service problem on your hands. So you work to sort of stagger those acquisitions to keep the sort of <coughs> the bus infrastructure um, predictable to avoid sort of catastrophic failures. Um, they also do things like provide new routes to meet you know, constituents' mobility needs, the sort of obvious things that management people would be doing in this kind of an organization. And our point is that individually, a lone employee caring for passengers or equipment won't make much difference to the organization as a whole. But we saw care in this organization as systemic happening at small scales in individual buses, helping people get on and off. Also at larger scales in dispatch or fleet management, you know, monitoring and responding to goings on at multiple locations, things like we saw you know, in, our, in our data here. And it happens on different time scales, you know, days, months, years. And there are some things about the world that you just can't get around. Buses will always have mechanical failures and break down. Um, but these multiple and flexible ways of attending to the problems of buses and the problems of service sum together to sort of balance these needs against each other. You know, they provide a bit of efficiency and a bit of care and together it makes the system work in the way that it does. Now stepping back from our data itself, I want to sort of finish out by asking what this means for the design of new systems, in particular, where we're striving to take people out of particular roles. Um, how do we have to think about putting people back in? In what ways do we need people to be there to provide you know, this kind of, of caring you know, <clears throat> labor and affect to the system itself? And I think you know, few people are designing whole systems from scratch. Usually you're just designing one particular component, like the set of interfaces and workflows that the dispatchers used to do their jobs, which was one you know, reason we went to go see, like, how are these people working? How would we design something like that? Um, so how do you think about these kinds of care questions when you're building just one little piece? And I think this brings us back to the five sort of questions that we started with um, in sort of my half of the talk. Um, to take to the, all the way to the margins of whatever the piece that you're building is and just a little bit further to think about how that's gonna impact all the other parts of the system that it ends up sitting in. Um, I guess what we've sort of come to, you know, in our work on this is that autonomous system design is really just work system design, you know, full stop. The fact that you're automating away a role is only the start of it. You really have to think about all of the other work that's happening around it. 
So just to return to these phrased differently, in as much as possible, we suggest making sure that designs for systems in whole or in part invest in human skill and autonomy where possible and appropriate. Um, make sure some of these people exist somewhere in the system. Um, attend to wherever the work may be, and if it shifts out of the realm of the piece that you're designing, consider what might need to be done to shift it back or to provide support and assistance to the people on whose shoulders you've now sort of put this new task by you know, creating a system that automates only part you know, of one piece of work. How would you help them deal with the mess that you've made? Um, as part of the first two points, you know, ensure there's flexibility in the design, that there's organizational tools, processes, and norms to handle things that are out of the ordinary. Measure the right things, have a good argument for you know, everything that you're measuring, be aware of how it can be inaccurate and what else you need to support those metrics. And then find a way to have processes and norms in place to listen for things that may not be measurable in numbers or surveys, but nonetheless matter for doing the right thing, whatever the right thing you know, is for your particular use case or organization. Now we recognize that Transport is specifically a public service, and so its business model is different than a you know, private company offering automated taxis, for instance. But we still want to caution against losing these caring aspects of the system in a transition to automation and a focus on efficiency you know, above all else. Um, in designing services and, and, and you know, autonomous services to systems of care, we need to take up long-term responsible visions of you know, that system's place in a wider world and ensure that automation and optimization don't wipe these things out. Um, for us as ethnographers, design researchers, human-computer interaction experts, we have to remember that care is a process, not a product. It's in these relationships of living with and working with that Anne-Marie Moll talks about, about driven by a shared and enculturated sense of responsibility for the system and responsibility for others that care happens. Um, and we should attend to the caring dimensions of organizations and services we study and design. Um, these five points are part of what we think you know, it takes to do that well. And so looking more broadly at the work frame that Melissa began with, we have these different strands of philosophy you know, in what we do that comes back again and again thinking about accountabilities and how to keep track of them, thinking about the shifting of effort and work um, intentionally or unintentionally in the design of a system, making sure that we're being flexible to the needs of others. These are strong themes in our research on autonomy design, but they're also strong themes you know, in other work that we do that's not directly design work. Um, whether we're sort of designing an autonomous system, whether we're doing research on the public acceptance of automated vehicles, or whether we're doing one of these focused roadway studies like we saw in the beginning of how people interact in a particular location, we're trying to make sure that we contribute to systems that are human and humanity-centered by being aware of the impacts of what we're doing, by trying to be flexible, by trying to respect people in their lives and environments, and to take a holistic perspective on whatever piece of the system it is that we're studying. Thank you. Open it up to questions. Let's have some questions. Would you like to join me up here? Yeah. <laughs> so we have a system where the guy can't back up his bus because that's against the rules. Those are very good. We have a situation where it takes a few minutes for them to figure out where the stupid bus is stuck. And nobody's allowed to get out of the bus and help. Uh, the police don't get involved. Uh, it seems as though we've gotten things more complicated than they used to be uh, in this situation. I mean, probably three years ago, the, 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 the drive, you know, somebody could have gotten out and helped or, you know, or, or something. Um, and how do, we, how do we analyze these, these systems and their interlockings where, in fact, we've created bureaucracies in the small uh, and the efficiency is obviously reduced, not enhanced by this beautiful structure that's been created to, to have all these different roles that interact. Mm -hmm. So I'd say... <coughs> I, don't, I mean, I may be wrong. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's, there's two responses. One, one is a response on the, the, you know, whether anything has changed about the system. And I don't, I don't actually know, you know, what it looked like five years ago. The bus, right? um, but <coughs> I think part of... You know, part of what's going on is a balancing of different, different needs and responsibilities. 
Um, and for instance, having somebody get out of the bus to help, you know, would be, it would be very nice of them, you know, to do that. Um, it's also probably putting them at some risk that the, you know, again, this is, this is where bureaucracy comes in. I think the interesting point about bureaucracy, and I don't, I don't have like a, you know, an answer to the problems of bureaucracy in the modern world, but it is, you know, it's really set up as a system oftentimes where, you know, that, that flexible, flexibility component is already being sort of taken away. That's the, the point of a bureaucracy is that everything is the same way, and, you know, if you don't like it, and you can take a hike. And yet, in this case, several of those broke down. There were breakdowns in every situation you described, yeah. and, and they had to reach outside of the system for yet other approaches that hadn't even been considered in the yeah. design of the system in order to solve it. Yeah, I mean, I think sometimes it's the, the you know, not to say that this is a perfect system by any means, and I think if you had, you know, good remote camera access, for instance, from from the dispatch center on each of the buses, minus privacy reasons and other things, there would be a lot of these situations that you could sort of, you know, smooth out. But I think it's when, you know, when you have a bureaucracy and people go outside of it for these reasons that the interesting stuff happens that really, you know, makes things, makes things work smoothly. And so I think there's, there's something to be said for every, you know, every system has those sorts of hard and fast rules that people tend to adhere to um, and then it's the moments where, you know, the moments where someone will I'm reminded jump outside. Of, that, yeah. I have to just say this. I'm doing, you know, association with last month's program where we had somebody from Park talking about uh, AI and ethics. And the thing he talked about was the reason this project is, has any legs and is moving forward is because the company is interested in risk mitigation. And so... You know, I think you're, in the some ways you're talking about the same issue. But I was going to say that in this case, another option for going outside the system could have been that the driver would have decided, I got this, mm -hmm. I'll just back out, <laughs> you know. And for whatever reason that she was maybe, you know, newer in the system, thought it would be observed and she would be dinged, that there was something unsafe about it, you know. So, I mean, you ask a great question and there's no perfect answer for, you know, other ways. Next question. <laughs> You're talking about the fact that you feel that the bus system is derailing. It's not happening in any bus anywhere else. <laughs> so I just wanted to. It's on. It's on. Um, so I, I think that it's a good that you're looking at this in the um, context of automated vehicles, um, because otherwise I think what would happen is that we would see what we are happening seeing happen in retail, which is that in retail stores are moving toward, you know, people just picking up the product and walking out the door with it and the sim store somehow, you know, charges them and all that stuff. Uh, or that you go to a, an out, uh, you go to a, a self-checkout stand and they can, in so doing, they can get rid of the personnel mm -hmm. that they had sort of helping people out the door. But the problem with that, pro that process in retail is that the care is gone, right? And so, there aren't people floating around the stores looking to help people who are having trouble finding a product or finding the right product or, you know, that sort of thing. And so a lot of us now spend a lot of time wandering around stores that, uh, you know, and so we're not, we're not being cared for as customers as much. Mm -hmm. um, so without what you're doing in this automated vehicle realm, uh, I fear that we would see the same thing happening in that realm because of the the economics, you know, the economic pressures on the companies to lower their um, costs and uh, produce um, high, increase their profits. So. Yeah, and I think for I mean for some <coughs> for some retail situations that may be a fine approach, but it's a surefire way to turn a retail environment into like a physical web store where you're still, you're wandering around, you're looking at products, except you're doing it through the browser or you're doing it in person, but there's not necessarily somebody there to help guide you through it. And I, you know, that's another model that I've, you know, I've thought about in my own experience of going to, you know, stores and finding where there's nobody here to help. It's a rare case that I need it, but when it's there, it can be, you know, a very valuable thing to have. 
so um, your study was was fascinating. You're, you're looking primarily in the at the transport case where there is a fundamental system of care in place already, right? The, the bus network is a service, and so mm -hmm. they've been thinking about these issues of, I can't help but notice that none of the companies that are in your long you know, organizational name have anything like this at all, right? I mean, when I buy a car, they're like, okay, here's your car, you drive away, and it's like, good luck. And if you wanna buy AAA so you can have a breakdown assistance, that's, that's up to you. Is there an implication of your work that in order to move into autonomous vehicles, you know, Mitsubishi at all will need to create a system of care like this at some national or worldwide scale? Because of course, you know, you're talking about a local bus system, but I can drive my car, you know, pick it up in, in, in Utica, New York, and head for Baja, you know, Mexico. So how will we manage all of this potential care and assistance that people need in the autonomous vehicle context? Well, I, I think one thing is to um, um, recognize that though we are, you know, large mass consumer car market, um, which makes it very interesting because we have to think of all our different markets of, of users. Um, the future with more autonomy, uh, especially if you look at how the convergence, we now, people now talk about pace, connected, autonomous, shared, and um, electric mobility, that as you see all that converge, that the models of transportation are likely to continue to evolve. So, you know, probably most of us in this room easily remember a day before ride hailing, right? And so, and then look how that's taken over. Look at how scooters are entering. So the mobility landscape is really shifting and so likely will the business models of, of you know, all the, the organizations are exploring what that will mean for the future. So that's one aspect of it is that you know, it's not only the personal private car um, sales. Already Nissan and the, the rest of those companies are large suppliers of taxi cars, cabs, uh, those sorts of things. Um, Renault is in the truck and bus business. Uh, so there's a range of, of sorts of things. These transportation systems are evolving. Um, and so to understand and be a part of that, we have with autonomy and connected cars, we also have some very valuable data. And of course, all cities and, and local regional governments are looking at the opportunities of what can happen with integrating data. So I think that it's a very, very evolving space. But then on top of that, with the, um, the SAM, the Seamless Autonomous Mobility, the remote supervision, which is what prompted this whole project to begin with, um, to, to begin to think about, um, it's the extension of if anybody drives an Infinity, which is the premier band, uh, brand of, of Nissan, you have access already to um, the SOS, the Infinity Connect. Um, this is the OnStar kinds of services. So already with personal cars, there are ways in which there's a connection to a remote um, location. And I don't know how much is happening with those and what people's experience with those you know, on an experiential level is, but that model is also already even in um, private cars. So looking at this whole changing mix and then how do you support an autonomous vehicle if we believe these call centers as we do will need to be, uh, not call centers, control centers will need to be a part of that we have to sort of rethink what those combinations are. So, um, you know, there's a range of, of ways. This has very direct application, as, as you know, Eric sort of mentioned, um, in what, it, we, but this talk wasn't focused on it. We were looking very much what the information sources, the workflows, the scale, like how, pe you know, what kind of tempo and rhythm of work is there. Um, so we are directly feeding into the development of our seamless autonomous um, mobility capability for that. Uh, yeah, I want to thank you for a very interesting th talk. But the talk, um, I can't help but to think of the analogy of the elevator operator, where at one time there's this an indispensable guy who operated the elevator, and now he's gone. And, uh, and it was all about efficiency. So I can see that uh, the, these automated buses will go either that way, where it's a horizontal uh, elevator, you get in, you press a button, you end up where you want to go. Or, like you guys say, oh, this bus goes around the whole city. We can provide this extra care that the old system provided. So in one case, the elevator operator went the way of the 
uh, the, the, the doorman. <laughs> yeah. But uh, w w what are your comments on that? Well, I'll start with just, I mean, the elevator operator actually, as I understand it, was there for a long time more for customer service, that it was a perception of trust and comfort. Um, so it, w it was maybe initially that people didn't understand how it functioned and they have to push a button and stuff. But over time, I mean, you only have to watch that once or twice before you get how this works. And then it was the discomfort of being in this contained space with strangers, what might happen, maybe you need somebody there to arbitrate that experience. Um, you want the customer service of somebody helping you, it's the red carpet kind of treatment. And the, the time that they lasted was in fact quite, lo quite long. Having lived in New York City, doormen are still alive and well, I can assure you, we love them. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, so yeah, this isn't to suggest that this all is going to be permanent or look always the same way. Of course things are evolving, but in the space of mobility, which is a way more complicated um, movement system, right? There's unintended, you know, unexpected things that cross your paths, like the, 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 the dog that runs across and all the kinds of things that an elevator does not do and doesn't have to encounter. So the likelihood of needing extra care and extra attention over a longer period of time, I think is also part of the system. So. <coughs> yeah, and I, I mean, I would say about the elevator example in particular, I mean, I don't know that they, they certainly work you know, quite effectively. I don't know that they're the sort of, you know, peak of caring technology. Every time I get in one and there's a weird clunking noise and I'm wondering, you know, am I gonna be stuck in this though? I remember that there is always a call button that will connect me, you know, to emergency services or somebody who can help. So even that system though, there's no, you know, we took the doorman out, but now we have a sort of information system with people on the other side who are there. If there really is an issue with your elevator, you know, hopefully you can get some, some kind of assistance. So I think it is possible to sort of shift, you know, how, where that care labor happens, how much of it you put in. You know, those are design choices that, that you know, go into any particular technology or system, you know, that you choose to build. I'll, I'll just add one other, just sort of taking a different track, but it's interesting if you look at the, again, we're partly, as you can tell, from <laughs> the sort of broad cultural and social sweep, interested in a range of the systemic effects, um, even elevators and that kind of functioning, um, it, part of that story relates to cars and on mobility. So you started having more elevators when you could have taller buildings and you couldn't have taller buildings until you had a density of people all in one place that needed the elevation. And that happened often with office places and workplaces. And you couldn't have a density of people working in the same environment until they had cars to get there readily. Before that, people would work you know, five, 10, whatever, a walkable distance from where they were living, which meant that workplaces were more spread out. So there is a systemic effect of how automotive affects building and gut urban density, which leads to the elevators, which, you know, again, shifts your kind of the mobility landscape. And that's, you know, back to the earlier question of, you know, we expect this landscape's gonna continue to evolve in all sorts of ways. Uh, hi. Um, Thank you for being here, first of all. Um, I just had a, regarding like the whole system uh, diagram and everything, I was wondering about if you could comment on the decision to not um, include like the users of the system, or hmm. arguably the users of the system, the like customers, customers. of the bus, yeah. Um, not including the customers in the system di diagram. I guess, you know, it wasn't, they're not one of the active roles in the in the stories that we tell, except for the one customer who, you know, wants to get off because the bus is stuck and they've been sitting there for five minutes and they could just walk to their destination. Um, I think, you know, the so they're 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 not included because they're not part of this particular story. Um, we did actually go into this with you know great interest, I think, in what are the kinds of problems that people on you know, customers on buses have that they need assistance with? Um, and where do they go for that assistance and how, how do they get connected to information that they, they need? So it is something that we've researched elsewhere and we looked at cases again in which, you know, the, the people would talk to the operator of the bus who might be able to answer their question. We heard bus operators radio into dispatch for like scheduling questions that they couldn't answer. Like I have a passenger who's trying to get to some other location, like what can I tell them? 
um, and you know, dispatch also making fielding direct calls from from customers, which they're technically they're you know not. It's not their telephone number in dispatch is not intended for that, but they sometimes did it anyway. And so they are active parts of of the system. They weren't active parts of the the design work that you know we were thinking about on the what we selected for this for this talk. So it's not. I mean, it, it's a little bit of an oversight, I guess, to not put them on the diagram, but it's. It wasn't because we weren't focused on what their needs were and what they were doing. And if I could just um, toot Eric's horn for him, um, Michelle's best kept secret. Shh. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, he one of the first studies that Eric did when he uh, joined us was actually to think about what would be the experience of people inside of vehicles if there's this human in the loop, like again, this Wizard of Oz, suddenly like you're in an autonomous vehicle, it's disabled, something's happening. You're trying to figure out what the system in the car is doing. What is it seeing? What does it know? What is it going to decide? You're trying to figure out what your should do. And now there's like these other people in the car, and you have to wonder like what are they doing and what are they thinking? So a lot of what we're trying to also understand by this is literally like do we need, what kind of communication capabilities do we need in these kinds of environments? And so Eric did a really interesting study to try to understand people's kind of perception and expectation if they were told they had access to this kind of person who could help them out, when and how and why would they um, you know, access that person, what modality might they use to do that, how did they think about and understand um, who that person was, are they the kind of this, this angel on my shoulder, somebody who's with it for me or like a little big brother, somebody watching me, that's scary. Uh, so that was a very interesting, so we have explored from that the kind of user standpoint in many different sorts of circumstances. But thank you for asking the question because it's always embarrassing when you're kind of the user experience people and you keep forget to talk about the user isn't that way. I, I, I didn't mean to say that on the spot, I'm just genuinely curious. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, last one. Oh, uh, the, I'm not sure the medical caregiving system or a bus system would be the thing I, I would look at. All, you know, it's a huge, complicated problem. Who knows how many ways or what the most profitable ways of looking at it are. But really, in the bus system that you studied, only the driver is being contemplated to be replaced, right? You wouldn't replace the route supervisors. You wouldn't replace the dispatchers. In fact, you might load them up with more work. But the driver. You want, what would you replace them with? You could have some sort of auto switch where the computer drives the machine, and then what? A kiosk with a, a sort of a mannequin with a bow tie who you can ask questions. I'm going here. Do I use your bus, or can you ping me when I get to a thing? Can you connect me with dispatch? Really, you're, you, if anything, you're going to be loading dispatch up, and there's no intermediary now except what the kiosk can figure out from uh, basic rider questions. So I'm not sure what I'm asking here, but let me just uh, stop there and see what your response is. Um, so I'll, I'll let you go in just a moment. But my, my first comment would be that I think that's, you've hit on one of the key you know, questions that we came away with after we saw the way that the system worked, and we saw that you know, just all of the labor that operators in the buses were doing that weren't, wasn't about driving, and was about you know, interfacing with all of the messy things that are going on in, you know, in the world around them, um, and that <coughs> you know, how, would you, how would you structure a support system for that if the person weren't there? So there, I know, you know there are people working on you know, accessible vehicles elsewhere, I don't remember what organizations are doing this work, but you know, imagining vehicles where you, you know, automated type vehicles where you could get your wheelchair yourself, you know, up into the vehicle, or there's, you know, a motorized system to help you. People are imagining exactly what you propose, that there's some sort of, you know, kiosk or help button where you could be connected with either, a, you know, a chat bot or some sort of human behind the scenes. So I think those are all, like, they're all design options. Um, but I think one of the key concerns is, you know, as a, when you're thinking about what bus operators do as just driving, it looks like it's so simple to just drop computers in and, you know, move on. 
But when you, know, you realize all of the relational work do. that they do. Sorry. The worst would be what we do at our desktop, right? Would you like to be connected over the internet to a chat or uh, help? Or, you know, you can search by, you know, uh, uh, there's a little search queue. You could put your words yeah. in, hope you get the right answer. Was this helpful? Uh, what a clogged up system you'd have. <laughs> And you would need some, I mean, if you were to do that, you would need multiple layers of human help in the background. You would need people who were capable but and not qualified. Locally. Of it, you would be loading up dispatch like crazy. All the bus drivers would come into dispatch, sit at screens. <laughs> <laughs> would you be needing the bus system if all the cars are automated, right? Why would you need a bus system for the public if they can just call the cab and go wherever they want to go? Yeah. Point to point, and who needs a schedule of stops? <laughs> well, I think we should, we should continue this conversation among ourselves, but you don't have to sit in your seats anymore. How about that? So let's thank our speakers for bringing us these great questions tonight. And we'll see you in one month, same location, second Tuesday of the month. Bring a friend.